Right, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at a 1541 Mark II floppy drive. So it's interesting the uh, shape change. I'll show you one of the older drives in a minute. I've got a 1541 and a 1541C. I previously covered Mitsumi and Alps models of those on my channel before. But uh, I thought it'd be interesting to look at this, and Jamie's been asking me about this actually, and I said, yeah, no worries, I'll have a look at it. Um, he's a friend of Anthony over at Riot Retro Gaming, and it was actually Anthony that packaged these up and sent them to me. So, uh, yeah, thanks for organising that, Anthony. So you can see on the back here we've got the uh, four pin power, so it's got an external power supply. We've got a couple of power supplies with this, I'll show you in a minute. One of them I think works, one of them doesn't. I don't think we're going to be able to do anything with the, the faulty one, but we'll see. We'll just have a look, see what's wrong with it. Uh, obviously your main switch, um, well not main switch, the power switch, the mains is obviously, you know, dropped down to low DC voltage just coming in here. You've probably got like 5 volts and 12 volts sort of thing going in there. Dip switches here to select the device ID, you know, so you can toggle between sort of 8, 9, 10, 11. And then you've got the serial ports here, it doesn't matter which, uh, I don't think it matters which cable you use there because they're both in parallel, those, ironically, uh, those serial connections are paralleled up. So it came with a cover letter, this. Uh, I'll just quickly look at this. Uh, Hello, Mr. Gadget. Please help Jamie and Big Balls with their retro issues. They can, will pay. <laughs> they will pay, in caps. All the best. Helen. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a joke. Uh, following on that um, video I uploaded recently about the EVP thing. So this is one of the older 1541 drives here. You can see how much longer it is. Uh, these will work with the uh, VIC-20 and the Commodore 16, you know, the C16 and the Plus 4, I think, as well. Do tune into Jamie's channel. Um, it's usually usually there's a live stream on a Friday night, and it's usually Amiga and C64 playthroughs. But you'll often find lots of classic games, uh, you know, hidden gems that you've never seen or heard of before on his channel. I've picked up quite a few games from his channel that I've never played and have uh, actually grown to love them. But he's a really nice guy. He's fun to watch and listen to. So yeah, go and check his channel. I'll put a link in the description below. So they kindly sent me uh, this as well uh, to keep. Now bear in mind these are scratched. Um, look at that one. Can you see that? That looks terrible. I'm not sure what's happened to that. Um, but I could always get these uh, professionally resurfaced. Well, I say professionally, you know, take it to a game store or something. There's uh, some scratches on here. Quite a deep one there. But the other ones are quite minor. Initially, I'm going to have a go at cleaning these actually with some cotton wool and uh, plastics. We'll just uh, give that a go. And all I'm going to do, as I say, is get some uh, plastics on there, some super soft cotton wool here. And we'll go around in circles. Uh, now, they do recommend you're not supposed to go in circles, but this is a totally flat surface. So it's not like you're going into the grooves of a record, for example. You're not. Yeah, so this is uh, going to be something that needs professional resurfacing. This level of cleaning is uh, not sufficient. You see that? So just testing the two power supplies out here. If I just plug this one in, and I do know one of these is making both the LEDs stay on. So yeah, it's not the sort of thing you should do. You should measure the voltages first. But that's already happened to this on a number of occasions while they've been trying to work out what's wrong with it. So I thought I'd show you. So that's the normal procedure there. When you power one of these up, the, both LEDs light and then the green LED goes off. I'll just show you that again. As you see. So now with the other power supply, you'll see they both stay on. Which makes me think there's something wrong with the 5 volts actually. I think the 5 volt level is perhaps low. So I'll try and show you this. The top right pin there, that's ground. And then you've got 5 volts, 12 volts, I think. It's, can you see that? 3.7 volts there. That, so that's why it's not booting. But there is no 12. Either of those other two pins there, you can see 0 volts. 0.4 volts. So, yeah. There's a problem with the 12 volts. It could be this DIN, that's one possibility, but then again, the Transformers are renowned for failing. You know, it's like, uh, I'll show you in a minute, but it's like a solid mass of epoxy inside. The Transformer will be a rectifier in there, uh, a regulator or two, I would expect, uh, and a cap, maybe. Um, but because of the epoxy and how hot the Transformers get, the fact it's, you know, it's just totally sealed in with the epoxy there, these things ultimately, you know, they die. They don't, uh, they don't last forever, and they're kind of non-serviceable. And we'll do that same thing for the, uh, you know, good one, the one that we know works, although ultimately I'd probably be looking for a replacement for this one as well, actually, uh, if I was uh, Jamie. Uh, and I'll try not to block the meter here. 
see there 5 volts 5 volts is, yeah you can see there 5 volts is looking healthy and as you can see the 12 volts is healthy there as well 12.34 So now we know that the, this power supply is good, we've plugged the serial in, the other side of this just connects up to the C64, as you can see. So we'll switch the drive on again, so it's initialised OK, switch the C64 on, that's normal. And we'll try a disc. Now Anthony did say on this one, he thinks that uh, this drive was working up, to, up until the point Jamie put a cleaning disc in. Um, now those cleaning discs, they make me laugh because they're just, they're just not very effective at all, but they're awful in my opinion. And uh, this is a good example, you know, the fact that Jamie used one and it's created him a problem of how bad they are and why I would not use them. The same holds true for CD cleaning discs you can get. Uh, you know, I'll see if I can show you one later in this video, you can hear it hammering the disc there, it's, it's struggling, it's probably hitting the... Going, yeah, it's trying to find the BAM, I think, and if I show you what's happening on the screen... Yeah, you can see the file not found error there, so I think this just needs a clean up. So looking at the underneath of the drive here, you can see there's four screws actually, just uh, Phillips, you know, crossheads I think. So I'll get those four screws out and uh, clean up the headers I think to start with. I'm wondering actually if I need to remove the knob from the front. Let's try that. Let's just pull that off carefully. Come on. It may well be that the whole thing sort of slides forward. Wow, that was not easy. Yeah, that was not easy to work out. It's just clipped on on the front there, but it looks like, you know, it kind of hugs the front and makes you wonder what on earth's going on. Look at all the dust in there. No wonder that doesn't work. No wonder that doesn't work. But yeah, I can see I can see some crustiness on the head there straight away. If I just uh, lift the uh, thing here, just look down there at the surface of that head. I'll put your macro. Where my nail is there. Look at that, that black crud. So yeah, it just needs a clean up. Now since I did my original 1541 uh, clean up and repair videos and the Amiga ones I've seen people doing their own videos and they go, they stick the cotton bud on and they just go like this from side to side oh let's gently wiggle across the head there and you don't get, you've got to use, you've got to, you've got to put fr pressure you've got, that, you've got to get friction like that, can you hear that? as the cotton bud is sliding on the surface there that's the only way with IPA that you'll perhaps get it all off and in fact, whilst I can see that looks like that's cleaned that up nicely now already as I, as I explained in a previous video, I use this Meguiar's Plastex actually, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very smooth, solid surface there, um, and you get stuff rubbed on there from the head, from the friction, you know, because this thing pushes the thing down there, and you, you've obviously got some pressure there with the head, uh, you know, it doesn't just float above it by a small amount, it actually presses, it makes physical contact with the disc as the disc slides around. Um, and that's why you get the contamination not burnt, you're sort of like smeared on there with friction. So IPA does not always bring it off. You've got to use something slightly more um, abrasive. And I don't really like the word abrasive because this stuff's not really abrasive in the sense of like, you know, you would imagine sandpaper, for example, because that is, <laughs> is pretty abrasive. But this stuff is just abrasive enough to polish, to make a, you know, a smooth surface go super 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 smooth and shiny and remove any impurities that are sort of clinging to the surface and IPA often will not bring those off that's why uh, you know I always go for this two two step approach now and also clean around here as well because you do get bits of stuff flying off onto that as a result of that friction on the head um, but I don't think we're going to need to demagnetize this or anything and the chances are I think the heads are going to be okay so I'll just use a fresh cotton bud now and then you know what, I'm going to go and test it before I do any more cleaning of the dust and stuff in here. You know, it does need a full clean, which I will do in a lubrication. But I suspect that just doing what I've done here now, that's probably going to spring back to life, I suspect. Well, so much for a quick, easy test. This thing... Um, seems to have fallen to pieces actually. When, we, when I pulled this off, it seemed to pull this bar all the way down here, which has made this piece fall out. So I now need to carefully reassemble this. It's not broken, it just needs 
that carefully. Reassembling is the hardest bit, is trying to get that back into there. There we go. So that I can, there we go, push it like that, I think. Do not underestimate how painful that is to reassemble. But as you can see, I've got that working again. So let's stick the disc in now and let's give it a go. Let's just see if we can get a disc in like that. There we go. I shouldn't really leave this hanging here, but it'll be okay. So switch it on. So you can see it span there. So C64 boot up. So we've got our load command. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I think that's working. You can just about see it moving there. It's moving hardly at all. It's very slow. I've not got a fast loader on here at the moment. Still loading. And a few minutes later, you can see we've got a ready. It's decompressing. I think that's worked. So, yeah, it leads me to ask the question, Anthony, what are you playing at? You could have fixed this yourself, mate. And it's the same with the power supply, um, you know, you, you could do what I could do, which is probably, ultimately, to find another alternative power supply for this, an aftermarket one. Maybe one of those hard disk ones you can get, I've got one spare, I think. So I might be able to go using that, that's it, run stop, um, start one play again when it finishes loading. Yeah, I pointed you back at the drive there for a minute, because I thought it was doing some more loading, but it wasn't, it was just decompressing from the uh, RAM. But if you can hear that's working. Start again. Sweet. So now we know that was all that's wrong with it, I'll just clean up with cotton buds and stuff. I'll just show you some of that stuff. We'll perhaps have a look at the main board as well. So I'll remove this uh, lever again here. Now you can see what's happening there. Can you see that? It's pulling the lever right through. I'd suggest, uh, well, yeah, there's no easy way to do it. You're going to get, that's going to happen for the most part. Certainly on this one. There you go, pulled it off. Um, in fact, it's pulled it out a little bit. It should go all the way. There you go, it's come back through again. Yeah, it should go all the way through to a point uh, over the other side of that piece of metal there. You might just be able to see it there in the recess. It just goes through and presses against this almost there. So, yeah, it's not very well designed that. It could do with like a circlip or something. Maybe it's supposed to have one, I don't think so. Um, but yeah, when you pull the arm off, that will all generally fall to pieces if it's anything like this one. But you can see how vulnerable that is to breaking there, actually. You know, this uh, ring round here is, is there to support that for that very reason. But it wouldn't surprise me if those are quite a common uh, failure point. So I think the way we'll work on this is disconnect the uh, heads there, that's the heads, or the head, there's only one, singular, not plural. Carefully pull that one up there, same there, these are for the motors and stuff and the sensors. And we've got some screws here, two on each side I think, that hold the drive mechanism, so we'll get those out. And then I think, uh, hopefully, this should come out now. Just need to be mindful of this connector here, which seems to be soldered on, it is actually, to the front. So we'll move the uh, drive out of the way and you can see the PCB there. So you can see it's looking a bit dirty down there. Top side of the board's pretty clean, but yeah, I'll thoroughly clean that. I'll take the board out. Swap these uh, three caps, I think, while we're here. There's two down here, one up this end here. Very little in the way of caps, because obviously, you know, you're smoothing the stuff's all done with the power supply itself. Lots of dust down the sides there, as you can see. May as well use the vacuum to collect the majority of the dust before we start using cotton buds and stuff. So I've got it on the SD mat here, we'll just uh, go around with cotton buds now and some IPA. So there we go, it's had a quick clean, you've got the 6502 APA CPU, 
that's your ROM which is socketed. The interesting thing is some of the older drives, well a lot of the old drives, these things are socketed so you've got like 6522's here, these are your VIAs, very similar in functionality to CIAs but not quite the same. Um, and then you've got uh, a gate array type thing going on down here and uh, here as well. This is probably replicating a lot of the smaller chips that you see in uh, the older drives actually because the, there's usually quite a lot more uh, uh, TTL logic, uh, there's hardly any on here. You've got your clock generation stuff here I think because you know there's your main crystal and your uh, trim cap. I suspect those are going to be uh, part and parcel of the clock stuff. I do remember a while back I looked at the schematics for this actually and I think the master clock comes in here and I think it then gets fed out to the 6502 I think that's the way it works it could be wrong um, it might get uh, split here but that, that was what I remember from looking at the schematics so yeah very simple boards it's just a bit frustrating that these things here are not socketed uh, including the RAM you've got your RAM over there so on the other side of the board it's perhaps worth reflowing the connections here for the power socket and the serial ports here but actually the solder looks all right um, I'll reflow them while I'm here anyway, it's uh, it's not going to create any problems doing that. Uh, it's worth inspecting just to make sure we've not got any dry joints anywhere, but that board's looking super super good actually. I think the only thing I need to do is, uh, is change the caps. The other thing I will do, which um, is worth doing, is getting some contact cleaner into the power socket here, maybe even the serial ports, but the power socket in particular, and the power switch, because this is just like you get on a C64 board. You know, these are susceptible to the contacts going and getting all tarred up and dirty um, inside. Um, so yeah, consider doing that as well and we'll do that to this one. Using the desolder station here, but you could just use a, you know, a cheap solder iron and a desolder pump. So let's just add a bit of solder because it will flow better with fresh solder that contains flux. On the ground side, you might need a little bit more heat actually, because the thermal um, mass of the board you know, the, the mass here of the metal is going to absorb the heat on the positive side. It might be a bit easier. There we go. Right, so I've got one off there. I, uh, I've cut that because my desolder station blocked, actually. It's not blocked at all since I did the review, and then, lo and behold, today it blocked. And I think it's just because I didn't let it warm up enough. You can see solder's gone there. Let's just get a bit of fresh solder and flux onto that point. The reason you add fresh solder and flux is, well, primarily because the flux is not there, it's been washed off the manufacturer, there you go, and the flux helps it uh, flow a lot better. But yeah, those caps are off now, so we'll get some nice new Panasonic ones on there. So I've got the bottom one off, they're all 10 microfarad. Can you see the positive mark down here on the left hand side? So as we rotate this cap here, you can see it's got a band on one side with a negative on it. The band indicates the uh, negative. So we'll just carefully uh, stick that there. Slightly lower voltage these, these are 16 volt instead of 25. But re remember the voltage is coming into this, you've got either 5 or 12 on the DC jack there. Well it's not a jack is it, the, the DIN. So I've got the cap in there and we'll just uh, solder that back in place. Again bear in mind you might need to use extra heat around uh, this area here because you can see the quite large trace around there means that it's absorbing an awful lot of the heat there. Yeah, that one's a lot easier. Yeah, that side's a lot easier. Let's trim that down a bit, that's still a bit big there, that's okay. So that's all three caps replaced, we'll just clean off all the flux. So I'm going to reflow these connections here just because they're not very good and we'll just clean up those connections then with uh, IPA and cotton buds as well. But the connections are nice and uh, reliable now, I think. So we'll clean inside this with uh, just some soap and water, actually. You could just put this in the sink and use a scrubbing brush and stuff, but yeah, we'll be able to clean it almost as well this way. I've gone in circles like that, you know, around those there already, but yeah. If you've got any bits of dirt on there, you can just get a bit of soap and water and do a bit of that around those uh, embossed bits, you know. So we'll clean up the underside with a bit of IPA actually, any of these little black marks should come off. And uh, you see the feet, see how dirty that is. Just give that a little wipe there. And hopefully you'll be able to see how much cleaner that is. <laughs> can you see the difference? Yeah, spot the difference. So I'll just give this a wipe with some IPA just to get the bits of dust because there are a few bits of dust in the corners there and then we'll start to reassemble it. 
So shielding back into there. I can get these screws back in place here now. So all three screws back in place there. One thing I'll point out while we're here, these 6522s, you can swap these with Rockwell 6522s. Uh, and I think you can do the same with the CPU as well, from what I remember, but uh, you may need a resistor on the, uh, is it a pull down, I think it is, on the um, IRQ pin, then uh, I think, depending on which one of these you put it on, I'm not sure. But just bear that in mind, and I do know if you do that mod with the Rockwells on a uh, VIC-20, you do need those uh, resistors there, uh, or at least I certainly did from my tests, uh, it wouldn't work without it. And I think one of these is kind of used for the serial interface, and the other one sits between the CPU and uh, either this chip or that chip, I forget which, to actually uh, you know pull the actual data as it's read from the drive through to the CPU. So the next thing now is to focus with cotton buds and IPA around the drive mechanism here, around the chassis uh, initially, I actually just collect all that uh, dust and so we're not really cleaning at this stage, I will go over and give it another clean with cotton buds and um, IPA when I've collected all the dust, the idea is to collect it like that and the cotton bud being wet actually makes that uh, super easy, you know, because it then sticks to the cotton bud the aim here is to just remove it all and it might not be obvious, but bear in mind you can just carefully move the head up there to get under here to collect all that so it's starting to look a lot cleaner now, move the head uh, back carefully just down here so that I can get the cotton bud into here and try and collect some of the dust from around there. Super hard to get access to certain parts of these but if you get in at the right angles you can get the cotton bud right into all the uh, areas where there's dust and fluff and just try and collect it all like I say. You can see a big chunk of it there, look at that. And you can squash cotton buds flat with pliers and then you can get them into there. So on the underside I'll just carefully clean the belts here it's strictly speaking it should replace a belt like this and you can just spin the capstan or whatever it is around there to get it to uh, rub gently on that and that's all you need to do is just try and clean any surface uh, contaminants off it really if you've got a belt that's uh, it's in one piece but it's not working very well you can boil it in the microwave you know superheated for like five minutes don't burn yourself on the water when it comes out let it cool down before you use it but that can bring uh, strength back into belts actually and the reason you don't want to put too much pressure on it because you'll stretch it. It's as simple as that. So back over to this side, it's looking a lot cleaner. I'm going to get some molly cotton to the rails and stuff next, clean the rails up. You can see the available resistor there for adjusting the RPM. There's no timing wheel on the underside of this like there are on some of the old drives. You have to use a frequency counter or some software on the C64 to determine the RPM. So I've cleaned off the bit of dirt that was on the rails actually, not a lot. And I'm just going to use some uh, Mollicote, oh, Mollicot. I'm not really sure how you pronounce it, I've been using this stuff quite a while now. Picked it up off 12 volt for its uh, channel. So yeah, just get a little bit of that, and uh, I don't know if you can just about see this, just get some onto the rail there. Um, the nice thing with this is you can just use the head itself, once you get it in place you can use the head to try and distribute it, but you need to get it fairly close to where the carriage is actually. Yeah, so you may need to wipe some of this off, if you've got excess like that there, remove it. You just need a little bit. And perhaps get a smidge of it on that piece of nylon there where that bar slides on because as you rotate that there, it, it slides like that there. Yeah, that should do it. And I think finally, the other place I would actually put some, it might sound crazy, but it's on here, just a, a small amount because you've got plastic on metal there and any kind of lubrication you can give that, the better. And just wipe off the excess, obviously. That'll do. So we're getting near the end now, I uh, see some light at the end of the tunnel, we'll get the mechanical part back in. I think the other thing I would do is just get a tiny drip there like that, use a cotton bud, uh, and just massage it around that area there, because when that spins, I can't spin it from this side I don't think, it uh, just helps the thing just be a little bit quieter in its movement. We can move the thing around there, though. that should get that bit of oil there, yeah it doesn't need a lot. Now if your 15412 is anything like mine, you'll need to get the fascia in the right place before you try and stick this on actually. You need to sort of get it like that, there, then get the screws in. Shorter screws for this. So before I clean up the front of the drive and stick the lid back on, um, 
The other thing is clean this sponge thing here. It's, it just puts some pressure on the disc to help with the reed as it spins around. Can you see there's a little bit of brown stuff coming off there? You might not be able to see that, it's very light. But uh, yeah, just rub over that with some IPA as well and use the dry end. It just helps keep the disc clean actually more than anything. And then I'll use a separate cotton bud and just wipe over the uh, head with some IPA again now. Just to make sure it's super clean after we've been blowing dust around and stuff inside there and uh, obviously the lid's been off it. We'll get the lid back on. So the front's had a wipe with IPA, but we'll get a bit of this plastic cleaner on and you should be able to see it gets all these little black marks off, they come off super easy. Be careful around the uh, thing here. Um, one thing I will say is those usually have a plastic film on, you can usually peel them off, but I'm not going to do that, I'll leave that up to Jamie to decide if he wants to do that. You have to be careful, sometimes it can sort of stick to the thing and you can actually make it worse by trying to peel it off. You know, it can destroy the, the logo underneath, but that's quite rare. Most of the time it looks like new when you peel that off actually, if it does, as long as it's, you know, it's like I say, it comes free. But as you can see, all those marks are coming off with the plastic cleaner there. It's looking a lot cleaner. The IPA was just not cutting it. So yeah, final result is uh, not too bad. You know, there's a few marks and things on the top here. You know, you're never going to get all the marks off something like this. I'll clean up the serial cable and the power supply cable as well in a minute. Now, rookie mistake, I did accidentally knocked those dip switches when I had the PCB out. So when I've just tried to load from uh, device 8, I was getting a device not found error. I thought, oh no, I've got a fault. And uh, then I thought, maybe it's those dip switches and lo and behold, yeah, one of them had got knocked. So I've just reset those back to, you know, identify this as uh, device ID 8. And if we switch it on now, you should see both LEDs, then one goes off. And if I switch the C64 on, both go on, and then the green one goes off. So I've got uh, my copy of Ghosts and Goblins in there. Let's just do a load, start, main, come on, one. You can see some activity there. And as you can see, that's loading, so we'll give that a minute. There we go, so it's loaded, run, decompressing. We should get some sort of crack throw train, trainer sort of thing coming up, I think. It's not focusing very well, uh, but yeah, as you can uh, hear, that's working fine. High scores, no. Sweet. So I'll try my copy protected version of Chase HQ. So I think that's loading. I can never remember, I do remember some lines vaguely. You get some lines there. It's got fast load built in, I think it's quite quick the loading on this. Yeah, that was uh, really quick loading actually. Probably about 30 seconds ish. So the next thing we'll do, just to be 100% sure, is load this diagnostics cartridge here from the world of Johnny. And we'll get a blank test disc that I use for this sort of thing. So I switch it on. And we'll start by going into the performance test, actually, P. Because what that'll do is a series of tests. It'll format the disc, write to the disc, uh, read back to the disc and erase from the disc, various things. There's a number of things that does in a sort of sequential order there. Incidentally, if you've got a bad disc, it usually fails in the format. I'm guessing there's perhaps some sort of verify, it might verify the BAM or something at the end. But as you can see, the first part worked okay there, mechanical test okay. Open file for writing, it's writing to it. And then I think it perhaps, it might read that back and then I think it erases a file, you know, scratches something from the disk and then updates the BAM again and just checks that it's, you know, it's gone. Yeah, it's reading it back, I think, you know, to verify it. And now it's erasing the file. Sweet. So the other thing that's useful about this cartridge, when you've lubricated the um, rails there like I have, you could use like the head exerciser or something, uh, let's just try the H, and you can see you can step up and down tracks or half tracks and stuff, but it's easier to do it with the top off so you can see the mechanism moving all the way up and down, but I don't need to worry about that, I've formatted a few times on this now, you know, so it's you know, starting at one side of the disc and going right to the other end, so um, 
it's had a bit of exercising already, it doesn't really need it. But all the tests there are fine, I've played a good dozen or so discs on this without an issue, format three or four times, I've done the performance test three or four times, that's been okay. So yeah, a nice easy repair. When I first spoke to uh, Jamie about this in chat on one of the RRG videos, I pointed out my first thoughts with this were that because the LEDs were both on, it was probably a logic fault, perhaps the CPU, ROM or RAM. Uh, and that's perhaps where you would start. If your voltages are okay, that's where you want to look because the drives are not initialising if both the LEDs are not going off. And the fact we had you know, just over three volts there, that's you know enough to power the system so you can get these LEDs to light, but it's not sufficient for the CPU and the rest of the, the, the uh, electronics on there to be able to process normally. So yeah, we were kind of getting a CPU crash probably, you know, the CPU wasn't able to boot properly because of the low voltage. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.